This morning we're continuing our series on discernment, and as we begin, I'd like to, uh, to read a few verses. I don't have it marked in my Bible, so now I have to turn to it. In Deuteronomy, chapter 32, and in this text, This is um, at the end of Moses' life, and he's given um, this speech. It's called the Song of Moses, and it's a speech about the work that God has done. But I just want to read these first three verses as a call to hear, a call to listen. And, And may we receive these words this morning, just as the people received them when Moses gave them, as a call to listen to the word of the Lord. Verse 32, sorry, chapter 32, verse 1, it says this. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak. And let the earth hear the words of my mouth. May my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew. Like gentle rain upon the tender grass, and like showers upon the herbs, for I will proclaim the name of the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Heavenly Father, as we are here with open ears, may we hear from you. And may your words seep into our soul the way the morning dew seeps into the herbs of the garden. May we absorb everything that you have for us today. May we be shaped by it. In the name of your son Jesus, we ask this. Amen. Amen. Uh, So we're in this series on discernment, and we're going through uh, these five stages of discernment, and each week we're looking at um, a certain stage. The first week we looked at uh, the step of of silence, how we begin the discernment process uh, of spending time in silence, And, and, and out of the silence we call upon the Holy Spirit, and we looked about how we you know, we, we empty ourselves. We, we empty ourselves of, of um, you know, any attachments that we're holding on to, that we, we, that we want certain things or don't want certain things. So the first step is to sort of empty ourselves of all those pre-attachments, those, those thoughts that we already have, to kind of give that up and call upon the Holy Spirit to guide us, uh, to speak to us, and to inform our decisions, to form our questions, and all those things. And so uh, the, the second stage of discernment, what we looked at last week, is forming the question. Having emptied ourselves and having called upon the Holy Spirit, we, we now form the question in the discernment process. And, and we looked at how sometimes we ask the wrong question. And so the, the key is figuring out how to get to the right question. And I have found that usually it goes something like this, that a wrong question comes from a place of, what do I want? Right? I, do, I don't want to work in this job. I want to work somewhere else. I don't want to live here. I want to live somewhere else. I don't want to do this. I want to do something. And, and the, the focus is, what do I want? And, and through forming the question, you will find forming the right question involves shifting from, what do I want? To what does God want? What does God want of me in this current situation, where I am right now, in this place, in these relationships, at this work? Does God want me to move on, or does God want me to do something here and now? So that, that will be a helpful shift when you know you're getting on the right track, when your thinking shifts from what do I want to what does God want? And we wait for that question to arise. So we talked about that, how, and, and as you can tell, there's, there's a lot of waiting 
in this discernment process. We, we wait for the Holy Spirit. We wait in silence. We wait for the, the, the right question to emerge. And then here in step three, guess what? You get to wait some more. <laughs> in step three, what we'll be diving into this morning is listening and sorting thoughts and waiting for a confirming sign. So we'll spend more time waiting in this step that we'll explore today. But don't worry, you won't spend eternity in waiting. Next week, we're going to get into the response. You will get to do something and respond in a way. And then, of course, the fifth stage to go forth in peace. And so um, stick, keep, keep waiting, and then we will be getting to some actions next week. And so, but, but this is a, a crucial step in the, in the, the, the discernment process. Whenever you're making any sort of decision, a big decision, a small decision, or just the lifestyle of discernment, of of offering every choice that we make to God, this is a crucial step of listening and sorting and waiting for confirming signs. It's also, I think, the step that, that has the greatest level of anxiety. I think it might be the step... That's, that we get wrong most often. There's lots of traps in this step. There's lots of opportunities to, to go astray in this step. In this stage, you'll, you may be presented with, with many options from many different sources. If it's a decision about work, you might be thinking about, okay, do I stay here or do I leave? Do I do I leave the state? Do I go to a different state? Do I change my career altogether? Do I stay at the same company but change, I'll go to a different position? Do I go to a different company in the same position or a different company in the same position? And all of a sudden, all of these options are flooding you. <laughs> Have you ever been in a situation like that? You're trying to make a decision and all of a sudden the op- it feels like you're swimming in a sea of options. You're like, how in the world am I going to sort through this? And so that's why I think this step comes with so much anxiety. It can be so overwhelming at times. Listening and sorting these different sources and where they're coming from. And so this morning, I'd like to offer just a few helps for you to consider as you navigate this phase of discernment. Maybe you're in the phase now. Maybe you've just recently have gone through this phase. You will most likely come to this phase again in the future. And so hopefully these steps, these helps will um, aid you as you navigate this phase. But as we begin, I want to, to share with you a prayer I found from Pierre Tehard. Italian, it's a, it's a French name, I'm not sure I pronounced it correctly, but it's this beautiful prayer, and, and may we receive this prayer as a, as a prayer for us. It goes like this, above all, trust in the slow work of God. We are quite naturally impatient in everything to reach the end without delay. We should like to skip the intermediate stages. We are impatient of being on the way to something unknown, something new. And yet, it is the law of all progress that it is made by passing through some stages of instability and that it may take a very long time. And so I think it is with you. Your ideas mature gradually. Let them grow. Let them shape themselves without undue haste. Don't try to force them on as though you could be today. What time, that is to say, grace and circumstances acting on your own goodwill will make of you tomorrow. Only God could say what this new spirit gradually forming within you will be. 
give our Lord the benefit of believing that his hand is leading you and accept the anxiety of feeling yourself in suspense and incomplete. I'm going to read that last line one more time. Accept the anxiety of feeling yourself in suspense and incomplete. The first help I want to offer us this morning comes from that last line, and, and it's simply this, in, I say simply, but it's not simple at all. In patient trust, accept the anxiety. As you're navigating through this, this muddy, the muddy waters of the discernment process, trust that God is leading you. Be patient in that, and in that patient trust, you just have to accept there's going to be anxiety. <laughs> you just have to accept there's going to be a lot of options presented to you, and you're not going to know which one is right. You're just going to have to accept that there are going to be many vo voices speaking into your life, and it's going to be overwhelming. And you're not going to know what to do. And it might be like that for a little while. But if you can just go, this is just a part of the process. I can just accept that for this period of time, I'm going to be incomplete. I'm not going to know what to do. There's going to be lots of options. It's going to get confusing. <sighs> accept that anxiety. And then suddenly, there's a little bit more peace in the instability. Suddenly, in the midst of the, the murkiness, you can have this clarity that if, if you know anything, you can know God is guiding me. This will not last forever. The waiting will not last forever. The instability will not last forever. The confusion will not last forever. Clarity will come with patient trust. I think of Joseph in the book of Genesis. Joseph is a man who practiced remarkable, patient trust in the Lord. If you think about his life, and if you're not familiar with his life, here's kind of a, a short synopsis. He, he was the, the son of Jacob, who is Israel, who had you know, the sons who became the, tr the 12 tribes of Israel. And he was the youngest at first, and he was the favorite. He had, you know, he met Joseph in the, the multicolored robe, and, and he was the favorite of, you know, his father, and his brothers despised him for being the favorite. He would brag about being the favorite. He was kind of an annoying, you know, younger brother. And so finally, his brothers had enough of it and um, ended up selling him into slavery. So he went from the favorite child to being sold into slavery, and he ended up as, as a slave in Egypt, and he was sold to a man named Potiphar, and he was a servant of this man named Potiphar. And so he, he lived his life as a servant, serving in the household, doing all these things. But, but he found favor in Potiphar's eyes. And so he, he grew to a prominent position until Potiphar's wife falsely accused him of assaulting her. And so he got thrown into jail. And so now he's spending his days in jail. He went from the favorite son to a slave to a servant, finding some prominence even in servanthood, but now he finds himself in jail, in, in a dungeon. He spent years of his life in this state. I mean, we're talking decades of his life being a slave, a servant, a prisoner not knowing what God was going to do with his life. And yet, if you know the story, he ends up interpreting some dreams. He kind of gets the ear of Pharaoh. He gets out of prison and is placed in a prominent position in Pharaoh's court. He was the second most powerful person in Egypt. There was Pharaoh and there was Joseph. And God placed Joseph in Egypt and gave him the, the, uh, the gift of interpreting dreams to save thousands of people from famine. 
God used all of this roundabout way of, of being a slave and being a servant, being betrayed by his brothers, and all of this heartache and pain and suffering and uncertainty. And at the end, God placed him in a place where he was able to be a blessing and save thousands of people from, from starving to death. And then his brothers come to Egypt. And the brothers don't recognize Joseph, but Joseph recognizes the brothers, right? And so to make kind of the long story short, Joseph reveals himself to his brothers, reveals that he is this prominent person in Egypt. He is the one who is saving them. He is the one who is, that they are bowing down before. And, and he brings his whole family to Egypt. Um, and then at the end of the book of Genesis, um, after Israel dies, all the brothers go to Joseph and they beg his forgiveness. And Joseph says something remarkable. He says, what you intended for harm, God intended for my good. That's patient trust. Seeing all of these things coming at you, some, some things that are heartbreaking coming at you, betrayals from family members, uh, being out of control of, of your profession, um, being a slave to whatever it is you're being a slave to, to, you know, to being, going through false accusations the way Joseph did, to, to have this, this up and down roller coaster of a life, to have no certainty, and yet through it all, Joseph knew, he had this conviction, God is going to use this for my good. It will not always be this way. What even my family uses for my harm, God will use for my good if I can patiently trust Him and accept the anxiety of being incomplete. The second help I want to offer this morning is that as you sort the sources Listen with your heart. As you sort the sources coming at you in the discernment process, listen with the ears of your heart. We've called upon the Holy Spirit. We have formed the question. And then as the options arise, we begin the sorting. And thoughts begin to rise. Some, you know, Conflicting thoughts, some competing thoughts, some challenging thoughts, some provoking thoughts, and, and, the, and we're sorting through which of these thoughts are from God? Which of these are, am I directing towards God? Which of these thoughts are coming from others? Or that I'm directing towards others? Which of these thoughts are coming, emerging from within me? Or that I'm even aiming at myself? Right? We're sorting this this mess of these sources. And I think that as we, as we sort through this, I think of Elijah, right? Another wonderful a biblical example, this prophet of the Lord. And, and Elijah was, was a man of God, a, a, a courageous, you know, powerful prophet of the Lord who faced a lot of adversity. But we find this story where he's fleeing from his life because the queen wants him dead and has put you know, a hit out on his head, and, and he's fleeing for his life, and he's going to, to Mount Horeb. And God comes to Elijah, and he comforts him, and he says, go to this mountain and, and wait for me. And Elijah goes to the mountain, and, and God tells him, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to pass before you, you know, kind of be on the lookout. And there was you know, a, a great wind that came through, and the wind was so powerful that it broke apart rocks. And it says, but God was not in the wind. And then there was a fire that came through, and the fire was powerful and just scorched everything, and it was a remarkable fire, but, but God was not in the fire. And there was an earthquake that was loud and powerful, and the mountains were, were cracking apart, but God was not in the mountains, I mean, in the earthquake. And then, as Elijah was standing there, 
there came the sound of sheer silence. Sometimes it's translated as a whisper. And God was in the silence. And Elijah wraps his face in his clothes, almost in shame, almost in awe. I mean, have you ever experienced this type of silence that is so powerful that it just brings you to your knees? You, we think of the big, loud, in-your-face, powerful things like fire and earthquakes and wind, but, but God shows up in these very still, small, sometimes unnoticeable ways, but if you are in tune with it, if you are listening to that still silence, if you listen to that whisper, oh, there is so much power in that whisper. There is so much awesomeness in that silence that it caused Elijah to cover his face as if he were Moses standing before the burning bush needing to take his shoes off. He knew this was holy ground. He knew the presence of the Almighty One was here because of that silence. And this is important as we listen and try to sort and try to figure out what voice is the voice of God, because the voice of God has certain distinct characteristics. The voice of God does not come to you like a powerful earthquake, just shattering your world and getting you to try to pay attention. The voice of God doesn't come to you like these powerful winds or these fires just trying to like wave around saying, hey, listen to me. God, God doesn't speak frantically. He usually doesn't speak very loudly. His voice comes in this still, silent whisper. But it's a whisper so powerful that it will rock your world more than any earthquake could. It will set your life ablaze greater than any fire possibly could. And so we listen with the ears of our heart to listen for that still, small, life-changing voice. And as we listen... We have to be very careful who we listen to. I'm going to offer some advice that may sound counterintuitive. Don't seek the opinions of others in the discernment process. I'm going to just offer that. You take it or leave it. But I believe in this discernment process, the opinions of others are not helpful. Others people, when other people give you their opinions, they're telling you what they would do if they were in your situation. The problem is, you're not them. They're not you. God has placed a wonderful plan for your life, and God has placed a wonderful plan for their lives, and they are not the same plan. They are as unique as your fingerprint. They are as unique as your personality. The opinions of others, I don't believe, offer clarity, but just offer more confusion. And so I would urge you to stay away from the opinions of others. And instead, sit in silence, listening for that still, small voice. And, and if thoughts and emotions become scattered within you if you feel fragmented and you need some more clarity. I think another helpful thing we can do is, is shift gears. It's really helpful to just stop thinking about the decision for a while. Um, go to an art museum and reflect on some art for a while. Take a walk in nature and observe the beauty of nature. Listen to some good music that you enjoy. Just connect with it. You know, just, cha cha like just shift the gears of your mind. Like stop thinking about the decision. Stop you know, worrying about the decision process and all the sorting and sort of just, just 
give your brain a mental break, and then something happens. Whenever your brain starts um, getting that rest for a little bit, without you even knowing it, it's working on the problem. It's sorting through things. It's getting you closer and closer to the voice of God. And as you're going through this process and as you're sorting through these different things and you're trying to live with the anxiety, try not to talk too much about the discernment process. Try not to get too much of the opinions of others. Talk to a spiritual advisor, a trusted spiritual advisor, because a good spiritual advisor will not give you their opinion. A good advisor will will help you kind of sort through things, help give you tools, help you ask good questions to help you think about things, but but will never really give you an answer because that's not their place to give answers. In fact, and hopefully this truth will be comforting, usually the answer is already within you. Whatever choice you're trying to make, whatever decision you're in the process of making, whatever you're waiting for and listening for, take comfort in knowing the answer is already there. You don't have to go and find it out there somewhere. The, the answer is within you. The task we're doing is just kind of peeling away everything to find it until God goes, yep, there it is. You found it. Which leads us to our, our third help, kind of third you know, step in this is, is wait for that confirming sign. I know we talk about waiting, and we don't like waiting very much, and we want to skip to the end, but and, and waiting can feel like we're not doing anything. Um, it's very counter-cultural to just wait, right, when you can be doing something. Waiting can feel like a waste of time. But waiting, this type of waiting, is not a passive waiting. This is an active waiting. This is an alertness. This is the work of of paying attention, this kind of waiting. This, 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 This waiting is an act of being rather than an act of really doing or not doing. Henry Nouwen uh, wrote this, and I I think it was on his book on discernment. Um, He writes this, Whenever there is a lack of clarity or, or ambiguous circumstances, it's time to wait. Active waiting is essential to the spiritual life. But the paradox of waiting is that it requires full attention to the present moment with the expectation of what is to come and to be patient to learn from the act of waiting. But patience does not mean passivity. It is an act of waiting in which we live the present moment to the fullest in order to find there the signs of the one we are waiting for. This is an act of waiting we're talking about. I think of the people of Israel as they, st- they stood before the Red Sea, right? And the Egyptian army was coming up behind them, and they, they were about to be you know, demolished by the Egyptian army, and they're trapped at the Red Sea. And Moses tells them, all you need to do is be quiet and wait. God will will act. Can you imagine that for a moment? You have all this pressure. You You have an entire army cornering you. And your leader is telling you, be still. I know the urge is to do something. Don't give in to that urge. Wait. And then, of course, we know how the story goes. God tells Moses to put his staff in the Red Sea, and a way opens up before them. 
Of course, they can't just stand there and do nothing at this point. Now they have to actually do the action of responding and walk through the Red Sea, right? So we'll get to that step next week of the, the actual response to the sign that God gives us. Um, but wait for these confirming signs. These, uh, just really quick, um, some helpful things for what confirming signs will be. A confirming sign has the indicators that it will be good for me. It's a good thing that I'm going to walk through this Red Sea and not get caught by the Egyptian army. Okay, this is a good thing. This is, this is confirming. Uh, the sign comes from the outside. It's not my idea, right? It's, it's something that comes from the outside. The sign pertains to the question at hand. There's a link, there's a connection that I can see. It won't be too um, obscure for you. It'll be a, a, a link. God will give you a sign that makes an obvious connection that you can see and tell. And the action I need to take has an accompanied grace to make it possible, even if it's difficult. It might be hard to run through the bottom of the Red Sea with an army chasing you, but God will give you the grace to get there. <laughs> it may be hard but there's a grace. It is a, it's possible. You can do it, even if it's hard. And the sign is big, or at least in proportion to the gravity of the decision. It rules out doubt. As you wait for these signs, as you see these signs, you'll be able to recognize, oh, now I have clarity. There's no more doubt on the sources. There's no more doubt on the options. This is it. And God is patient with us as we're waiting for these signs. He's gracious. He's very gracious. I think of Gideon in Judges. Another story, if you're not familiar with the story of Gideon in Judges, God has called Gideon to be, kind of be raised up as a hero to go save his people from captivity. But Gideon's unsure. Gideon has, he has this call placed upon his life to go and rescue the people of Israel, but Gideon's not so sure this is what he should be doing. So he asks God for a sign. He has a piece of fleece. He, he lays out the fleece and says, God, if, if this is really what you want me to do, when I wake up in the morning, um, and, the, and the morning dew has made everything wet, have the fleece be dry. And if you do that, I, I will know that this is what you want me to do. And so he wakes up the next morning. The morning dew has made everything wet, but the fleece is dry. But Gideon, he still doesn't get it. <laughs> He's like, ah, I'm not so sure. I, you know, um, and, and he even says, God, God, forgive me for asking this, but uh, I'm still not sure. I know you did exactly what I asked you to do but I'm still not sure. And maybe you can relate to that. Maybe, maybe you've asked for something and God gave it to you and you're like, yeah, I'm still not so sure. That's Gideon. Gideon, he, he, he asked the opposite. He said, okay, God, if, if I'm going to put the fleece back there and then tomorrow, if the fleece is wet and everything else is dry, then I'll know that you are calling me to this. And God is patient, and God is gracious, and he gives Gideon the sign. He wakes up the next morning, the fleece is soaking wet, and everything around it is dry. So don't worry if you miss the sign. Don't be looking and go, I don't know, was that the sign? Oh, I'm not, I'm not so sure about that. I'm, st I'm still confused. Oh, was that the sign? Oh, did I miss it? I don't know. Can I ask for another sign? Yes, you can. <laughs> keep asking, keep waiting until it's like, all right, this is it. And then it wouldn't hurt to just thank God for being patient with you because this <laughs> we're slow sometimes. So it's, um, keep doing this. I, Matthew, Jesus tells us in Matthew 7, I'm not sure if I have this text up here. We'll find out. Yes, I do. Jesus tells us, ask, it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened. A more literal translation, keep asking, and it will be answered. Keep seeking, 
you will find keep knocking. It will be opened. This, you don't need to just ask once and then wait and then be in despair. You, you, be persistent in this. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Remember that when Jesus says, I am the way, believe those words. These are beautiful words of hope and promise that there is no circumstance in which the living presence of Jesus, hidden though it may be, cannot guide us. There is no circumstance where his presence cannot remove the obstacles blocking us or give us the strength to, to move ahead. He is the way, and we must confess that boldly. But also remember that, that his assistance is not a magical incantation or a, a wand you can wave. It's not a genie in it's a, this intervention that makes everything go better does not go without our cooperation. God acts for us, but never without us. Never without inviting us in our intellects, in our our decision making, in our character. He never He never does anything for us, without us. The discerning life is a life of communion with God. It's a life with Him. It's the same withness, it's the same communion that we find at the table. In a moment, we are going to take communion together. And, and as we do so, I would encourage you to approach this table with the spirit of discernment. As you empty yourself the way Christ emptied himself, as you call upon the Holy Spirit, in the same way the Holy Spirit led him. And as you come to this table, may you, may you wait for him. May you acknowledge his presence. May you give him the benefit of the doubt that he is not only here, but he is guiding you and shaping you and leading you and he has good plans for you. So as we take these elements, may we take them in faith, knowing the Spirit of Christ kind of with beyond reason is here in these elements somehow moves through these elements somehow. Whenever we consume them in faith, He enters us into our hearts, into our minds, into our bodies, into our spirits, and shapes us more deeply. On the night that Jesus responded to the will of God by going to the cross for us. Going in the wrong order. He sat down with his disciples and he took the bread. And he broke it. Saying, this is my body. This is the good will of our Father in heaven that that I would be given brokenness so that you could be made whole. Take and eat this. In the same way, he took the cup and giving thanks to the Father, he said, this is the blood 
of the new covenant. That's poured out for all who believe. Take and drink if you wish to follow me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these elements of the bread and of the cup, of the body and the blood of your Son, Jesus, that lived so fully in your will, even when it was hard, even when it cost him everything. We accept the life that he laid down for us. And we, in turn, lay down our lives for his sake and the sake of his gospel. May we take this in faith as it shapes our life with you. In the name of the King who loved us and gave himself for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, the way we do communion here is um, you can come forward uh, during this next song. Um, I'll hand you the elements, and I'd ask you to just uh, go back, take them back to your seat and hold on to them while everyone else is receiving the elements. And then after everyone has received it, we're going to uh, read a prayer together and take the elements um, at once. Um, so come as you are ready. <laughs>